Hey everyone, uh, my name is Jerry, co-founder and CEO of Llama Index, and today I'm excited to talk about retrieval augmented generation in the real world. So just to give a quick uh, overview of the agenda that we'll talk about, uh, we'll first talk about you know, the basics of retrieval augmented generation in RAG, and also give an overview of Llama Index as a framework. We'll then talk about some challenges that users typically run into when they set up a RAG pipeline. And then we'll talk about evaluation, how to actually benchmark and measure the performance of your RAG pipeline, and then how to optimize it and solve different pain points. First, let's start with an overview of retrieval augmented generation. There's a lot of generative AI use cases these days, uh, ranging from document processing, tagging and extraction, knowledge search and QA, conversational agents, and workflow automation. The bulk of enterprise use cases that we've seen today typically uh, center around stuff around search and retrieval. And, and this relates a lot to this concept of retrieval augmented generation, where you can actually ask a question to the language model and its knowledge is augmented with information from a knowledge base. To talk about this just a little bit more, the way retrieval augmented generation works is it really is just one paradigm for inserting knowledge. So this is where you fix the model and then you put the context into the prompt window. So given any sort of indexed external knowledge corpus, you can first retrieve information from your knowledge corpus and put that information into the prompt window of the language model. Another paradigm for inserting knowledge is how do you actually you know, bake knowledge into the weights of the network itself? Um, through some sort of training process like RLHF, Atom, SGD, you can actually modify the weights of the network to internalize new information. What Llama Index is, is it's a data framework for building LLM apps. It's a data management and query engine for your LLM application to help you primarily do stuff like retrieval augmented generation with a little bit of fine tuning. And we offer components across the data lifecycle to allow you to ingest, index, and query over your external data corpus. So you start off with source data uh, from stuff like Slack, Notion, uh, Discord, to databases, to files like PDFs, PowerPoint, CSV files, um, and you load all this data into some document format. So we, we offer a lot of loaders on what we call Llama Hub, um, which contains over 150 data loaders to connect your data uh, into a centralized document format. From there, you can run a bunch of transformations uh, through this injection pipeline and integrate that with our downstream storage solution, like a vector database, graph database, as well as SQL database. Once your data is transformed, embedded, and stored within a vector database or other storage system, you can then run queries on top of it. So we have a wide variety of basic to advanced tools to allow users to retrieve and query over their data for a variety of different use cases. This includes solving some of these use cases I mentioned in the beginning, which includes question answering, summarization, agentic behavior, and more. Now that we've given an overview of, uh, of Llama Index, let's now talk about how RAG works. First, let's walk through the current RAG stack for building a QA system. Um, it really consists of two main categories. There is data ingestion, as well as data query, retrieval and synthesis. And so data ingestion is the process of taking your source data and transforming it into a format that you can then put into a storage system. Data querying is then the process for retrieving that data and then actually having it interact with, with a language model so that you can generate your final response. You can do all this stuff in around five lines of code and lava index to start with. But that's just the start. And we'll first talk about the basics of how this works. During data ingestion, the process goes as follows. We split up a document into a set of even chunks where each chunk is a piece of raw text. And then we generate an embedding for each chunk, uh, for instance, OpenAI embeddings or sentence transformer embeddings. And then we store each chunk into a vector database. During the query time, um, we do two things. We do retrieval and then synthesis. So for retrieval, we find the top K most similar chunks from the vector database collection by simply querying the vector database. Uh, it's what it's uh, specialized for. We take the retrieved chunks and we plug it into the LLM response synthesis module. And the, the two parts are outlined in the diagram below. So we've shown you how the basic RAG stack works. And now we can talk about some challenges with this naive RAG stack. 
there are some challenges that users typically face when they set up a basic rag stack like this. Um, and, and, and as you set this up, there's just a lot of different edge cases that you start running into um, that you realize that you might want to fix and improve. So some symptoms of this include uh, bad retrieval um, and aspects of this include low precision where not all the chunks in the retrieve set are actually relevant uh, to the, the question. Um, in this case, you might have a lot of just fluff within the retrieve context, which can lead to hallucination and loss in the middle problems when the LLM actually tries to synthesize an answer. You can have low recall where not all the relevant chunks are retrieved. Uh, and then this actually lacks enough context for the LLM to, to synthesize a proper answer. You can have other uh, failure modes as well, for instance, like outdated information where the data is redundant or out of date. Another aspect of challenge is bad response generation. So hallucination, for instance, the model makes up an answer that isn't in the context. Uh, irrelevance, the model makes up an answer that doesn't actually answer the question. Or toxicity bias, the model makes up an answer that's harmful or offensive. So what can we do? Um, how can we actually try fixing some of these issues of uh, you know, bad retrieval and then bad response generation? The thing about building a RAG pipeline is there's like a combinatorial explosion of different parameters and settings that you can configure. And only some of that relates to the actual prompts uh, to modify for the LLM. Uh, so if you even go back to the data, um, can we store additional information in these text chunks beyond just like the raw text, right? Can we have a better parsing strategy or chunking strategy? For the embeddings, can we optimize our embedding representations so that they're actually um, better representing the specific data that you have and aren't distracted by filler context? The retrieval strategy, can we do better than top K embedding lookup? And then synthesis, can we use LMs for more than just generation? You can see that for all of this stuff, um, only one part of it really is the LLMs. And of course, you could have LLMs and more parts of it too, but the whole point is we're building an entire stochastic system with a lot of moving parts. And so it's good to have the intuitions for just the different parts that actually affect the state of this overall system. And of course, we need a way to actually measure performance. Um, without, before you try out a bunch of things to try to actually improve RAG, you need a way to actually measure uh, quantitatively and qualitatively uh, how well your pipeline is doing. So let's do a brief segue into evaluation. How do we properly evaluate a RAG system? We can evaluate in isolation where we evaluate retrieval as well as synthesis uh, on, on their own. We can also evaluate end-to-end -end the generation performance where you take in a user query, look at the final predicted response, and then just try to understand the quality of that. So evaluation and isolation or the retrieval piece you can evaluate the quality of the retrieved chunks given the user query, where first, you know, you can, um, uh, to, to do this, you basically create a human annotated data set or some sort of labeled data set representing query and ground truth context pairs. You run your proposed retrieval strategy over this evaluation data set, and you look at how the, you know, predicted rankings um, measure, uh, match up to the actual expected ground truth IDs and see if the IDs are actually contained in the predicted set. You can then, um, given the predicted rankings, as well as the ground truth IDs, measure ranking metrics like MRR, precision at K, as well as NDCG. Um, you can also try evaluating end-to-end. Uh, -end. So evaluation of the final uh, generator response given the input. So given a user query, run it through your entire RAG pipeline, get back a generator response, and try to collect some metrics on that. And the steps are roughly similar. You create a data set. It could be human annotated. It could be synthetically generated. You run it through the full RAG pipeline. Uh, and then you collect some evaluation metrics. And so this includes metrics like correctness, uh, faithfulness, relevancy. Some of it requires labels, and some of it doesn't. So we talked about you know, some of the pain points with basic RAG, as well as how to measure um, the performance of it. So now that you have that step in place, now we can figure out, you know, how do we actually optimize the system? Let's try to answer more questions with some advanced RAG techniques. One way of looking at how to optimize your RAG pipeline is on a view from kind of simple techniques to advanced techniques. Um, typically, stuff on the left is, you know, simpler, less expressive, easier to implement, lower latency and cost. It's just going to be basic stuff that you should pretty much try just to try to squeeze out some performance. 
Um, the hard, the, the, as you get to the right, you're going to get to harder stuff, which is more expressive. You're going to potentially be able to do a lot more things, but it's going to be harder to implement and, and potentially incur higher latency and cost. So table stake stuff, uh, that we, we define this as like basic things that everybody should try. This includes like better parsing strategies, chunk sizes, hybrid search, metadata filtering. Advanced retrieval, um, uh, it contains kind of more advanced retrieval strategies beyond just like top K lookup, like re-ranking, recursive retrieval, dealing with embedded tables and documents. How do you do some sort of like small to big retrieval? Um, agentic behavior uh, includes a kind of using the LLM as a reasoning engine instead of just relying on some basic retrieval methods. And this allows you to process more complex tasks and questions allowing to do stuff like routing, query planning, um, as well as our multi-document arch uh, agent architecture. These things allow you to tackle more advanced query use cases. Uh, and then fine tuning, where you actually modify the weights of the model, which I briefly mentioned in the beginning. So that's one way of looking at it from easy to hard, but another way to look at it is just like, you know, specific pain points. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that you can try. And one way to organize it is looking at specific pain points that you're dealing with, as well as like candidate solutions for these. And so if we go through some of these, you know, some of the main pain points are one, retrieval is bad. If, if you don't have good retrieval, you're not gonna, you're not gonna have good RAG. Um, handling structured and unstructured data, parsing embedded tables and PDFs, as well as handling complex questions. Let's actually start with the first part, retrieval is bad. And then let's look at a candidate solution for handling the pain point of retrieval is bad. And, and we could, this is an advanced retrieval technique, a small to big retrieval. So the intuition here is that embedding a big text chunk uh, feels suboptimal. So part of the reason retrieval might be bad is because you're embedding these giant blocks of text. And um, when you embed giant blocks of text, there tends to be a lot of filler content. Depending on the quality of your embedding model, it might not actually encode the right representation for this content. So relevant context might not be retrieved when you actually ask a question. One thing we found that typically tends to improve retrieval performance is that if you embed text at a smaller level, for instance, per sentence, then you can actually expand that window during LLM synthesis. So instead of using the same chunk for both embedding retrieval and synthesis, you actually decouple it a little bit. In the diagram right below, you see that we can, um, you know, embed just this sentence, like over the 21st century. Um, and then when, when you actually retrieve sentence, um, you can then expand the window of context to actually feed into the language model. This leads to more precise retrieval. Um, an example shown on the right is that for this given climate report data set, when we try what we call our sentence window retrieval technique, which is the small to big retrieval example, you actually get back some sort of uh, proper user answer, right? The concerns outlined in this climate report. But when you try naive retrieval, um, you either don't get back the relevant context unless you widen the top K, or if you widen the top K, you get back some relevant context, but all of a sudden you lead to, you start, you just have way too much stuff in the context window and the LLM actually gets confused and it's not able to attend to the relevant context and the provided information. And so it leads to more precise and efficient retrieval by actually allowing you to retrieve more granular context. Another example here, and this is kind of more on the advanced side, is this idea of fine tuning embeddings to fix the retrieval problems. Um, Fine-tuning embeddings just means you're trying to tune the embedding representation from a pre-trained model to better represent the data that you have. And this can potentially lead to better retrieval performance. Uh, one way you can do this is you can generate a synthetic query data set from raw text chunks using LLMs. Like just chunk it up similar to how you build RAG. Um, chunk, up, chunk up a document, use an LLM to generate some questions from each chunk. All of a sudden you have a question as well as the ground truth context pairs. This allows you to use that as training signal to actually fine tune your embedding model. There's a few ways to actually fine tune an embedding model. Um, and the high level idea is you can tune both an out of the box like uh, model that's local, like a sentence transformers model. You can also fine tune like a black box adapter, like a linear model, neural net, or any neural net, uh, network. We have some of these abstractions in Lamadex, so highly encourage you to try it out. An example of embedding fine tuning is fine tuning a black box adapter. This is where you take any embedding model, right? It could be OpenAI API. It could be something that doesn't actually expose the, the underlying internals of how it works. But you take the output embedding and basically fine tune a transformation on top of it. It could be a linear transform, neural net. And the idea is that you transform it 
into a new format that's better adapted over your data. And you train this transformation layer uh, through fine tuning. Um, you can trans train this transformation both on the document embeddings or just on the query side. Uh, and you can and and the idea is that um, if you only do it on the query side, um, then you like if you actually train this and and continue to update the adapter over time, you don't actually need to re-index your document embeddings. You can just continue training the query embedding transformations uh, and and keep that as like a separate um, separate layer during inference. Let's talk about another pain point, which is handling structured and unstructured data. Um, a very basic concept here that pretty much uh, everybody building RAG should try is just use metadata filters. Metadata is context that you can inject into each text chunk. Uh, it could range from very simple stuff to more advanced stuff. And it could be very structured information, like integers or very small strings, or it could be longer, longer strings as well. Examples include page number, document title, um, uh, some more advanced stuff includes like summary of adjacent chunks, like questions that the chunk can answer. It's basically just additional context you prepend on top of every text chunk that gives it additional information. Why do we do this? One, it helps retrieval. It can augment your response quality too, because now you can put like sources, citations, stuff like that in the metadata. Um, it can also integrate with the vector database metadata filters. Most uh, vector databases have support for stuff like metadata filtering. Let's walk through a basic example. Um, let's say the question is, can you tell me the risk factors in 2021, right? And, and let's say you have a bunch of financial documents and they're all chunked up uh, and they're all across different years, like 2019 to 2021, and you throw them all into one single question in Vector Database. If you just ra run raw semantic search on this question, it tends to be very low precision. If you look at the retrieved chunks, you might get some from 2021, 2020, 2019. It's, there's no guarantee you'll actually return stuff from 2021 specifically. But if you can actually infer the metadata filters, like year equals 2021, um, you can then remove the irrelevant candidates, right? And then this will actually increase precision. Like given this question, if you can actually have some metadata filter that says uh, year should equal 2021, the way the vector database works is it'll first filter all relevant content by only things that fit within the metadata filter, and then it'll run semantic search within that. And so by adding this metadata to the different text chunks, you can then dump, put this metadata, store this metadata with the vector database, allowing you to run the kind of more structured queries for more precise retrieval. Another example uh, here is parsing embedded tables in PDFs or recursive retrieval. So how do we actually parse embedded tables in PDFs? Um, generally speaking, if you have a bunch of tables, chunking and parsing it by itself tends to be suboptimal. Um, this is because a table typically contains just a mess of like different text and numbers. And if you embed it, you tend to lose the actual semantic meaning of the table, which is, you know, this is a table for revenue, or this is a table representing some chart. So instead, what you can do is you can embed a reference summary to the table and then recursively retrieve the table. And this is uh, possible through our recursive retrieval abstractions. For instance, in the diagram to the right, you can have like a 10K and you have a bunch of uh, embedded tables in the 10K document. You can embed the text in the 10K, but for specifically like the tables, you can extract out a summary for each table and embed and index that summary instead. So then when you actually retrieve right um, the, the top level of nodes, if you find a node that corresponds to a that's a summary that corresponds to another underlying embedded table, you go ahead and fetch the relevant table instead. So an example here is at the top level um, for this SEC document, with recursive retrieval, you can ask questions like, what was the revenue in 2020? And you actually get back a, a concrete number, like uh, 31, um, 31 uh, you know, this billion. Um, and then without recursive retrieval, you can um, you just do some naive rag uh, use case. You actually find that it's not able to find a relevant chunk in this document that contains the revenue in 2020 because that information is encoded in a manner that makes it really hard to retrieve. The next pain point that I'll talk about addressing is handling complex questions. And this is actually an example that we have a pretty cool uh, Streamlit demo on. Um, and so thanks to, to Carolyn on the Streamlit team for helping to create this demo. Um, we'll first talk about routing. What is routing? Routing is simply a multiple choice picker. Given a question, it'll figure out you know, the underlying choices that that, it, that that question maps to. So what we can do is we can use a, a router abstraction 
to actually route to different query engines within Llama Index. And this dynamic selection uh, capability offered by routing allows you to do stuff like joint semantic search and summarization. So now you can have a unified interface that can handle both requests for summarization, as well as questions about specific parts of a document. This is actually implemented in a Streamlit demo. And so let's first, uh, let's go into this and, and show, show you what it looks like. So here, um, it's, uh, it's a simple Streamlit demo showing how you can chat with Snowflake's Wikipedia page. And this demo is powered by Llama Index. Um, because this chatbot is powered by Llama Index's like router query engine, it can answer both summarization questions as well as context specific questions. And so given a question, um, if the question seems like it would require context from the entire document, we'll go into our summary query engine, which will return all the context from the document so that it can answer stuff. But if, you know, if there's a question about a specific part of the document, it'll go to our vector query engine, which will do top K lookup from a vector database to actually return the relevant response. Let's try one question. What company did Snowflake announce they would acquire in October 2023? This seems like something that is a more specific fact, right, about uh, um, a specific section of this, of this Wikipedia article. And so you can see Snowflake announced they would acquire a startup named Ponder in October. And this used the vector query engine because this is a specific question about a relatively specific part of Snowflake. Well, let's say, you know, we ask a question like, what is Snowflake? This tends to be a general summarization question, right? And, and so because it's a summarization question, what it's actually doing under the hood is it's reasoning that, oh, you know, I, I don't just want to do top K lookup. I want to return all the context from the document. And because it's returning all the context and trying to synthesize over all the context, it does take a little bit longer. But you can see here, this actually created an entire summary of, of Snowflake, right? A very concise summary that contains a lot of different aspects. And you see here, it used the list query engine or the summary query engine. And this is a different query engine that actually returns all the context from Snowflake's Wikipedia page. So we talked about routing. Now, the next aspect that just to talk about is this um, concept of multi-document agents. Um, and this is really an evolution of a lot of agentic reasoning concepts towards an overall architecture that can handle complex tasks over large, uh, diverse corpuses of different documents. A core intuition here is that there's certain questions that top K rag just can't answer. Um, this includes stuff like, oh, what is the summary of a specific document or a subset of documents? This includes stuff like, can you actually compare and contrast like these two different documents within my corpus? Like for instance, two different resumes or two different financial statements. And so a solution that we came up with is this concept of multi-document agents. Um, a multi-document agent is a uh, agentic architecture built uh, basically on top of a kind of RAG architecture over different documents. And it enables fact-based question answering and summarization over any subsets of documents. Um, under the hood, you're basically doing top K lookup from a vector database. But what you do is you actually model each document itself as, um, as its own kind of query engine. So you index and chunk each document. And each document itself uh, can be modeled by a document agent. A document agent can handle both vector search as well as summarization, similar to the, um, the Wikipedia example, Streamlit example that we just showed. Like over a, a Snowflake document, you can handle both uh, search as well as summarization over that document. But by composing you know, all different documents and, and combining a bunch of different document agents together, you can have multi-document agents and you can have this outer uh, agent orchestrator that given a task can figure out what are the relevant documents to route this question to. And then given um, the set of like document agents that, that now execute this query, they'll execute the query and give back a response. And, and so basically you have like a collection of different agents working together to actually try to synthesize an answer. And each agent itself is kind of based on fundamental RAG principles. This enables higher level questions you can ask like chain of thought and query planning. And it can enable you to, to ask some of these more advanced questions like compare and contrast, like summarization over subsets of documents. And that's it. So we covered a lot of concepts. Um, we have a lot of uh, documentation uh, showing you how to do things from stuff like fine tuning to agentic strategies to advanced retrieval to stuff like better parsing. All of these are tailored uh, around solving different types of pain points 
And some of these are techniques that you can use to try to boost your retrieval and generation metrics. And so high level lesson is please define a benchmark and then try out these different strategies and let us know your feedback and track out the docs. Thank you.